Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Matt. Um, just to, we're going to start with a couple of songs, but hockey season started. I've been yelling at kids all weekend, so my voice is a little bit shot. Um, I, I maybe it'll even sound better. Who knows? Uh, I just want to. I'm wearing my youth group camp shirt from last year. The youth group is up at camp, so I just want to be with them in spirit. Keep them in prayer. We're going to start with a song. And uh, this song is called Before the Throne of God Above. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart, I know that while with God he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who's made an end of all my sin Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied To look on Him and pardon me To look on Him and pardon me Behold Him there, the risen Lamb my perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable i am the king of glory and of grace one with himself i cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is he with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. This next song is called Jesus Loves Even Me. I am so glad that my Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. If I forget him and wander away, still he does love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms will I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. 
Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song through eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Jesus loves even me. Again, great to be here with you. Uh, excited to bring the word of God to you today. And I wanted to pick up where we left off. Last time we were together, we were talking through uh, Christ as the Passover lamb. And that was the first feast that God fulfilled, Christ fulfilled in his body. And then, and I, I wanted to pick up and talk about what is the next feast that he fulfilled. And, and kind of maybe we'll go along this path when I'm with you and we'll talk a little bit about the feast that God fulfilled fulfilled in his physical body, the feast that Christ fulfilled and what's next, what's next on the agenda. So we're going to go back. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians 15, and we're just going to read the first 10 verses again together. Moreover, brethren, first of all, let's pray. Lord, thank you, Father, for giving us this day, and I pray that it would be a blessing. Lord, I know your word never returns void, Father, get me out of the way and uh, help your word just to speak for itself, Lord. And everything you've do, you've uh, you've always shown up strong. And Father, I pray if uh, someone doesn't know you, Lord, that they would call upon you. And Father, if someone does, I pray that they would uh, gain some strength by knowing that, Lord, you've put away their sins. And Father, I pray that you would protect our youth group this weekend, keep them safe, and just uh, put a hedge of protection around them. In Jesus' name, amen. So now let's go. 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures." and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles, and the last of all he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. For I am least of the apostles that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was in me. So uh, the last time we talked about Christ being the Passover lamb, slain for for the sins of the world as our sacrifice. And I just want to talk a little bit about the next feast that Christ fulfilled, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And as we read through this, we call out in verse 4 that it says, and that he was buried. That's an important part of the gospel. The gospel being the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And this is a very important part. And it's called out in verse 4 specifically and that he was buried. So why is it a part of the gospel? And it's important because this part of, part of the gospel is where Christ puts away our sins. Without the burial, the putting away is, is difficult to, to see. But when the burial is included, the, the important part, why that is good news, why that is gospel is because this is Christ putting away our sins. Let's look. I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 6, and I'll read a couple of verses. One, what shall we, shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Henceforth, we shall not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin, jump to 11. 
Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ our Lord. Let's look at 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Uh, neither yield ye your members an instrument to un of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as an instrument to righteousness. 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And 15, what then shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace, God forbid. And I want to kind of come zero in on this famous 623 which is for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see here, th this chapter is calling out that our old man is crucified, it's dead. It's with Christ on the cross. And sin's punishment, the wages of sin is death, but the punishment is hell. The punishment is is the is the payment for all of that. It's as we stand before a righteous God, sin needs to be dealt with. It's dealt with on the cross. And then uh, your sin is paid eternally. If sinning against, a, against an eternal God, it demands an eternal payment. And that punishment is hell. So let's look at a couple of verses. Uh, let's look at Matthew 12. If I go to Matthew 12, verse 40. So the wages of sin are death, and then, then this, this punishment is hell. And in Matthew 12, 40, the Bible says, for, jo for as Jonas was three days, this is Christ speaking, three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Let's look at Psalm 16, and we know that Christ did put away our sins. He did spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Look at 16, Psalm 16, 10. This verse says, For thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One, capital H, capital O, to see corruption. This is uh, Christ. This verse is about Christ, Holy One. There is only one Holy One, capital H, capital O, that is Christ. And this verse says, you will not leave my soul in hell. So Christ, in, he, Christ died and became the sacrifice. But we know that, that that Passover lamb, it is only temporary. It was only temporary. It had to be done again and again and again. And when Christ became our Passover lamb, it was once. It was once, so it was not only the sacrifice, it was the putting away of our sins. And this verse says, he took those sins to hell. And I just as a brief aside, verse 1611, your KJV, King James Version 1611 says, thou wilt show me the path of life. This is the only way. So I wanna talk a little bit about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and what is leaven in the Bible. And when Christ fulfills that in his flesh, what a big deal it is for us. Let's look at, at Exodus 12, I'm going to flip back, and I've got a number of verses to go to, so I know I'm going quick, but uh, uh, stay with me. Exodus 12, we're talking about this feast in, in Israel that, uh, that they were to, to commemorate a certain thing, and uh, we'll look at what that was and we'll look at why it's important Christ fulfills it in his own flesh. So verse 12, uh, 33 and 34, the Bible says, And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. So this is a time where the Egyptians were coming for the Israelites and the Israelites had to make haste and get out. And before there was before their dough was leavened, they, they, they took it and left. And if we look at Exodus 12, verse 15, 
this uh, this is the feast. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So not only does God say, don't eat leaven, he says, get it all the way out, get it out of your house. Not only does it say, don't eat it, it says, remove it from you. I don't even want it near you. And that's very interesting. So Christ takes away our sins. Well, what do the two have, have connected? Christ paid for our sins and now he's put them away. He's in the belly of the earth. What does that have to do with this feast of unleavened bread? Let's look at Mark 8. Mark 8. And we're going to go from 14 to 18. Listen here. So uh, now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, take heed of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So he calls the leaven of Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet? Neither understand, have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not. Having ears, hear ye not. And do ye not remember. So he makes this specific call out and says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, uh, stay with me. We're going to 1 Corinthians. And what's he talking about? They think he's talking about the bread. Look, he's talking about the bread. We should have brought more bread. Worried about the physical. They're worried about the flesh. I, I knew we should have brought more than, more than what we have. We don't really have anything. Uh, now, he calls out the let beware of the leaven. And he says, you're not understanding. You're not getting it. They're worried about the physical. Christ is not worried about the physical. So here we go in 1 Corinthians 5. The Bible says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and fornication that is not named as the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife, and ye are puffed up, that and have not rather mourned, that ye hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily, for I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that had done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one to Satan for discretion of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And that's what leaven does. Leaven puffs up the lump. Unleavened bread is, is flat. It, and and what, what is here? We know that pride puffs up the lump. And and what's, what's happening in this chapter is he's saying, don't you know that a little bit of leaven, a little bit of that sin, it, it makes everything bigger and it affects everything around it? Uh, uh, the, the, they're not seeing that this little bit, and what he is saying here is get rid of that old leaven. Put it out. Remove it. Remove it. You're unleavened. We need to be... Uh, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, that sin, that, that leaven, he's comparing leaven to sin. And Christ in that chapter compared leaven to sin. They're, they're using those words interchangeably. And he's saying you, you need to have this unleavened bread. Let's look at John 6. John 6. A little leaven Leaveneth the whole entire lump. John 6, we're going to start in uh, verse 30. 
They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe? What dost thou, thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. They said unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And then if we move ahead a little bit uh, in verse 41, he says, again, I am the bread of life which come down from, her, from, from heaven. Uh, and now in 43, they're kind of wondering, is this not Jesus? And in verse 43, he says, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which come down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So, this is how those two things are connected. The, the feast of unleavened bread was uh, and to remind them of a time where the world, where Egypt was on them and, and they, they were driven out in haste, but they had, to, they, they had to commemorate that by removing, their bread was unleavened there and they had to remove all of that leaven. And we learn later on through again, some progressive revelation that that leaven equal sin. When Christ said, beware of leaven, he's talking about that sin. When, when in 1 Corinthians, when it says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, it's that little sin, that sin that makes, that affects everything else around it. And by Christ fulfilling this, he's putting that sin away. He is buried on the feast of unleavened bread. He takes that sin, just like in the, the, uh, the, old Passover, the old feast, putting that sin away, he takes that sin and bring, puts it out of the house, takes it away. As far as the eye can see, he brings it, he pays for it, he puts it away. And that is why he stands here and he says, I am the bread of life, unleavened bread, sent from God to be your payment and to take your punishment. I mean, we have life everlasting because of that. And brothers and sisters, we need to remember that. Uh, we have Christ inside us, and that is the bread of life that will never ever leave us nor forsake us. Amazing, that's two in a row. The Passover feast, now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the next time together, I think we're going to talk about the Feast of First Fruits. So uh, I, hope you, I hope you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I hope you know Christ as your Savior. If you don't, just reach out. He knows your heart. Say, Lord, I want to take that sacrifice. Lord, apply it to me. Uh, be my Passover lamb and, and, and take my sin. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for thinking about us, Lord, and for stepping out of heaven and paying, paying, Lord, uh, not only in the physical, but, Father, also carrying those sins away. And, uh, Lord, I love you today, and I pray that this would become more and more real to me every single moment. And, Lord, if, if someone doesn't know you, I pray that they would ask for your salvation, Lord. Pray that in their heart they would call upon you. And if someone does, Father, I pray. 
pray that song we sang is when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Father, you've taken it away. So help us not to look back at those sins, Lord, and, and feel guilt about them because you've removed them as far as the east is from the west, Lord. They're in the sea of your forgetfulness. And uh, I pray that we would ever praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day.